Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's Family Connection Workshop entitled 3E Series Enroll. My name is Leslie Riccio, and I'm a Family Outreach Representative with the Office of Family and Community Engagement. This workshop will be the first of a three-part series focusing on options for students after high school. Tonight's session will provide useful information for students wishing to enroll in college. We have a variety of representatives from Virginia universities who will share information about the admissions process and how to be best prepared to enroll in college. Before we get started, I would like to inform everyone attending tonight that there will be two future Family Connections as a part of this 3E series. This will include a session on employment, which will be held on Thursday, February 24th at 6 p.m., and a final session on enlisting in the military, which will be held on Thursday, March 24th at 6 p.m. Please be on the lookout for information about these sessions and the question submission forms. At this time, I would like to turn the session over to Annie Chowns, Instructional Specialist for School Counselors in the Office of Student Support Services, so that she can introduce our panelists and facilitate the question and answer session. Mrs. Chowns? Thank you, Mrs. Riccio. I would also like to thank everyone for attending tonight's session. Let's meet this evening's panelists. We have Christina Badalas, Senior Regional Admissions Counselor from George Mason University, Monica Pinier, Senior Assistant Dean of Admission from the College of William and Mary, to Carla Moore, Senior Admissions Counselor from Old Dominion University, and James Penix, Associate Director for Recruitment from Virginia Tech. We appreciate you for being with us this evening. At this time, I will ask each of our panelists to share information about their school. Let's start with Ms. Badalas from George Mason University. Good evening, everyone. Very excited that you are able to join us to learn more about what the college enrollment process looks like. Um, to start with just a little bit of brief information about George Mason University. Um, which is also my alma mater, so a very proud Mason graduate, so very excited to share about my school with you all. Uh, we are the largest public research university in Virginia, and we have um, just over 26,000 undergraduate students with another 12,000 grad students on top of that as well. Um, our, our student body is also incredibly diverse. Over 40% of our students identify as students of color, and then we also have students who are from all 50 states and from over 130 different countries. Location-wise, Mason is right outside DC in Fairfax, Virginia. And what's really great about our location for students is that you are getting the best of both worlds because you have access to all that DC has to offer, but you also get to keep the perks of being within the state of Virginia, namely Virginia and state tuition rates. So 
all the city perks without the city price tag involved there. When it comes to our academics, we have a lot of different majors for our students to choose from, and we are a well-rounded school. We have STEM, humanities and social sciences, the visual and performing arts as well. So there's a lot of chances for our students to be able to explore and figure out what it is that they are passionate about and pursue that at Mason. We also have both freshman and transfer admissions options. So no matter whether you are going to be applying to college right out of high school, or whether you're going to be going to a community college first and then transferring on later, Mason could definitely be an option for you. So hopefully we'll keep your interest a little bit about Mason this evening and uh, we'll keep exploring to learn more about us later. Thank you, Ms. Bedalis. Ms. Pinier from William & Mary. Hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us. And uh, my name is Monica Pinier. I'm with the College of William & Mary. We are the second oldest institution in the nation, uh, established in 1693. And to try to keep us alive and going, uh, we always say it's thanks to our students that keep us innovative and moving forward and our focus as we learn, grow, and continue to do better and better each year. Um, listening to the voices of our students. We're a very active campus. We're located in Williamsburg, Virginia, so in the Hampton Roads area as well. Um, you guys might know if uh, you've come to visit Colonial Williamsburg, we're right next door, a short walk to that, so it's not uncommon to see people kind of dressed up in uh, historical gear sometimes. Uh, my favorite tradition in the whole wide world, we like to do a lot of quirky things for being an old school, again, you've got to keep it interesting, uh, is convocation, and that's where we welcome everybody on their first day of class as a freshman or a transfer student. Um, um, and pre-pandemic, it was a high five, but post-pandemic, it's been us uh, like shaking clappers and having signs like welcome home and you belong. Um, and it's just a great way to start off your education so that you feel like you're in this, uh, you know, very uh, collegiate and collaborative environment. Um, and we're all here to support each other. We are a public liberal arts and sciences institution. Uh, we actually don't admit by major. All students are admitted as undeclared for their first two years so that they can really explore the gamut in a variety of academic disciplines. Um, and then students will uh, decide which academic major or majors or a combination of three. Uh, the beginning of their junior year uh, moving forward. Um, we have, we're a smaller mid-size institution, so just under 6,500 undergraduate students, about 2,500 graduate students, um, about 100 programs in all that students can make into a combination of a major, double major, major minor. Um, and lots of opportunities for our students to have a unique educational experience. Of course, we want you to you know, be a little different from the time that you're getting that high five on your first day of classes to the four years later when we're giving you a high five when you're coming off the stage and graduating and some experiences that we uh, want our students to take advantage of and that the majority of our students will take advantage of or study abroad. We're actually the top institution, um, public institution for students who study abroad. Caveat 2020, not a lot of studying abroad, <laughs> but uh, it wasn't 0%, interestingly. Um, and uh, over 80% of our students will uh, participate in some form of undergraduate research, um, whether that's out in the field, in our labs, or helping our professors with um, academic journals. Uh, and we also have guaranteed internship opportunities uh, to, again, help students be as competitive as possible with these uh, kinds of experiences uh, to, for whether they want to go to graduate school, med school, um, for employment after graduating from William & Mary. Um, we have almost 500 student-led, student-run clubs and organizations. So if you, like my son, was very like, I'm not going to go to Williamsburg, what's there to do? Uh, we always like to say we're a largely residential campus. Uh, over 70% of our students live on campus. And because of that, we are kind of like a city within a city. And with those 500 clubs and organizations, whether it's a Monday night, Wednesday night, or a Saturday night, there's always something going on um, on our campus uh, to keep it lively. Um, we just welcome students this week and it's, it's great to have them back. Um, we are an early decision institution. So students can apply um, for an early decision one, a two, uh, two different early decision periods, and then a regular decision, uh, which is the most popular, especially if you wanna compare different options. Um, that's due January 1st of each year and students are 
given their decision uh, by April 1st. We also have a newer program called our Pathways where students are waitlisted and uh, attend their local community or junior college for the fall semester. Um, they can be granted admission to William Mary in the spring semester of their freshman year. So we're pretty excited about that. And we just had our first cohort come through and that's been really exciting. Um, and our application process is very holistic. So we look at multiple things and we take every student into context uh, to their high school. So it's not as, you might see statistics on our website, but I always say to take those with a grain of salt because you know we know every school is very different. So um, we don't wanna compare apples and oranges. We're always gonna take you into context with your specific high school. So, and if anyone has any questions, uh, always feel free to reach out to us at admission at wm.edu. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Pinye. Ms. Moore from Old Dominion University. Thank you, Ms. Chowns. Good evening, everyone, to Carla Moore from Old Dominion University's Undergraduate Office of Admission. Many of you may be familiar, we are located here in the local area. We are on Hampton Boulevard in Norfolk, just shy of the Norfolk Naval Base in the downtown area. ODU is actually your largest R1 research institution option in the southeast corner in the Tidewater region of our state. So many people that are looking for things in STEM H often look to ODU to be that leader. You will find a lot of active labs on our campus. We have a lot of partnerships with our local hospital systems, our naval bases, all of our military installations, et cetera. So students that are really looking for that connection will often consider ODU if they're really looking for STEM H, anything in those fields. You'll also notice our campus is fairly large. We have uh, almost 400 acres of campus. We are up and down Hampton Boulevard and back to Powhatan on the Elizabeth River. If you haven't been to campus, I recommend a visit. Um, campus has changed a lot just in the past, I'd say even five years, <laughs> um, let alone decades. So we've done a lot of building. There's a new residence hall on our campus that opened about a year ago. We redid our stadium about two years ago. We have reconfigured and remodified some of our buildings, adding some smart technology, new entrances, making provisions for students, adding eateries. Uh, campus really looks good these days. I encourage our local families to come and see us whenever you're in the area or just wanna do a tour. You'll notice as well that we have over 100 majors on the undergrad level and another 75 on the graduate level. If you're seeking a master's or PhD, you can pursue that at ODU. Also, you'll have opportunities for study abroad. You'll have opportunities for internships and cooperatives, and you will have opportunities to be residential. Our campus is residential, even if you're local. We do have currently uh, 14, no, 15 residence halls. I just forgot the new one. 15 residence halls. There are just shy of 6,000 people living on and around ODU's campus. And we do have residence halls for both undergrad up to the graduate level with our apartment living in the university village. So if you're interested in residential life, that is an option. You'll notice that we are division one in athletics. We just recently joined the Sunbelt Conference. If you have followed your local sports news, ODU has come up into that conference. And so we are competing um, with many Southeastern United States teams in that Sunbelt Conference. You'll also notice as well that with your opportunities for admission, you are considered for merit scholarships up on admission to the university. And of course, as Christina and of course, Monica stated, we do holistically review all of our students, um, even from all of the Virginia Beach public and private institutions or schools, everyone is reviewed individually in the context of your school. So you'll notice that as well. I do recommend any questions that you have, I'm happy to entertain those please check us out at odu.edu. And I look forward to answering questions later on in the program. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Mr. Penix from Virginia Tech. Awesome, thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, James Penix from Virginia Tech. I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. Um, Virginia Tech, we're one of your 15 public schools in the state of Virginia and state land grant institution. We're one on the larger side. Um, we have 30,000 undergraduate students and about 8,000 grad students. We do represent about 136 majors for, for you to choose from. 
Um, most people would hear about Virginia Tech when you ask them whether they know about Virginia Tech. Normally, they would talk about our football program or they would talk about our engineering program. So I spent all my time talking about the engineering program. <laughs> so it is one of the top engineering programs, not only in the state of Virginia, but also in our country. So um, we're proud of that. Um, we do see that we give students from all over. We represent 47 states and 53 countries right now. Um, it's pretty cool if you want to visit Virginia Tech. We're on the other side of the state from where you're located. I always say it takes me five hours to get to Virginia Beach area, so you can expect to do five hours to go the other way. Probably take you five and a half, but because I drive a little faster than everyone else. <laughs> but um, truly, it is a great campus to visit. Um, we, we like to say within um, New River Valley, it's a lot of things to do. Our students enjoy getting out and taking advantage of the great outdoors. You would find that our campus is very active. Um, student body is those type of students who are looking to explore, um, create, be impactful. Um, but service is a big part of the student body that's at Virginia Tech. Um, we're one of the two um, universities in the country that offer the core cadets as part of the student body. So it's us in Texas A&M on the, it's the other student, um, campus that offer that. Um, I do encourage you once again, just as my colleagues spoke, um, to visit the campus. I know as you get into the spring term, junior, sophomores, you want to get out and visit over those spring breaks. Um, but then as we start talking about the application process, you'll learn more. I'll give you a short um, spill on um, application process. We are one of the only schools in the state of Virginia that we review by major. So major matters when applying to Virginia Tech. Um, so it's important as you're looking at us, there's an undecided track, but if you're looking at the majors, that's how we review our applications as well. It's holistic in its review, but um, we're making sure that we fill all of our 136 majors. So all, I will always brag that even our forestry major or our majors that um, is, have like 50 students in it, we've, they're all filled to the, to the brim. So we really take care of our campus um, colleagues. Um, but we want to make sure students understand that to apply to the majors and you will be reviewed by that major in the context of your high school. So that's um, something unique I think Virginia Tech has to offer. But I will be glad to answer any questions about Virginia Tech as we go through tonight um, and be glad to help you out in the process. Thank you, Mr. Penix. <laughs> I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome Ms. Kelsey Roundtree, admissions counselor from Hampton University, and give her this opportunity to give us a little bit more information about Hampton. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Just want to thumbs up. Okay, perfect. I had some Wi-Fi issues earlier, so I'm just talking on my phone right now. All right. So my name is Kelsey Roundtree, and I am the senior admission counselor at Hampton University, but I also serve as a 2015 Very Proud Hampton alum. So I know what it's like to be a student at Hampton, as well as working for our illustrious university as well. So Hampton University, um, we were founded in 1868 by General Samuel Chapman Armstrong. We are so proud to say that our school is ranked as the top three HBCU in the country, according to US News and Global Report. So that is something that we definitely take a lot of pride in. We're located in Hampton, Virginia, surrounded by three sides of water. Um, so we're located right on that peninsula. Sits, um, our school sits on 285 acres of land. Um, in terms of population, we have about 4,600 students on campus and our professor to student ratio is 12 to one. Uh, so on average, you're looking at about maybe 20 to 25 students per classroom. So it's a very intimate classroom setting. The professors know your name, they know who you are. Uh, you're not just another number in the classroom. Um, some of our top majors include um, our School of Pharmacy. We call it six years, six figures, because in six years you graduate uh, with your doctorate coming out making 100,000 or more. Uh, believe it or not, that program has a 100% employment rate and uh, you do have to test into that program. Another one of our top majors is um, our biology majors, specifically more on our pre-med, pre-health track. So for those who are interested in going into med school, if you go on our pre-med, pre-health track, that helps you have all your prerequisites prerequisites. So when it's time for you to test into medical school, you're already on track with everything. 
Our school is partnered with the top medical schools in the country, one of them serving as University of Boston, and we serve as a feeder school for them. So that means that if you meet the requirements for our program in undergrad, it actually guarantees you acceptance into Boston as well. And then another one of our top programs also is our School of Business. Our five-year MBA major, that program also has a 100% employment rate. So I always tell students, when you're Fortune 500 companies, when they're looking to recruit minorities, um, typically they do go to HBCUs. And being the fact that we are one of the top ones, that is something that we are very proud of. Um, some of our notable alum, um, you might be familiar with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His mother graduated from Hampton. Uh, Booker T. Washington is one of our oldest alum. I don't know if anyone here has seen the movie Hidden Figures, uh, starring Taraji P. Henson, Janelle Monet. It was a true story based off the first three African-American women who launched uh, the space shuttle off into space. So one of those women was Mary Jackson. She is also indeed a Hampton alum. And our school is partnered with NASA. And we also have complete control over the whole entire NASA space shuttle mission. So our students have launched satellites, uh, which went off into space. And they also just recently renamed their headquarters off of our beloved alum, Mary Jackson. Um, we do have life outside of the classroom as well. Um, we are a division one school, including um, football, basketball, softball, volleyball, tennis, golf. We also have a co-ed sailing team, track and field and cross country. And our band is phenomenal. I don't know if anyone here has seen Beyonce's Netflix homecoming documentary when she was performing at Coachella. Well, our band was featured there. Also, our band actually went overseas pre-COVID uh, to perform for the Pope in Rome. We were the only HBCU to do that. And then also our band was at, um, asked to perform in the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade in New York as well. We were the only HBCU to do that as well. So um, I have lots, lots um, of information in terms of the admission process. Um, we do take the holistic approach, similar to what the other schools mentioned earlier as well. So we love um, to consider those well-rounded students. Uh, just to give you an idea of our average, our average GPA is about a 3.3, uh, 20 on the ACT, 1100 on the SAT. So that just kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking at. But like I said, we do take the holistic approach. We're not just looking at GPA and test score, but we truly look at everything. Um, so if you guys have any questions, comments or concerns I'd be more than happy to chat with you a little bit later thanks guys thank you Mr. Amtree as we move into the question and answer portion of tonight's event I would like to take a moment to briefly outline the academic and career planning process in VBCPS school counselors are currently meeting with rising 6th through 12th grade students to select courses for the 22 to 23 school year this process involves reviewing graduation requirements that have been met and still need to be met for high school students, explaining options for next courses, and discussing post-secondary goals with each student to ensure that course selections are aligned with those goals. Parent View provides parents and guardians the opportunity to view their students' course selections under the Course Request tab and track their progress toward graduation requirements under the Course History tab. Students, parents, and guardians will have an opportunity to make changes to the course selections being made now later in the spring through the course verification process. Parents and guardians are encouraged and welcome to participate in the academic and career planning process. If you have any questions about graduation requirements, your students' course selections, or would like to talk about your student's career plan, please contact your student's school counselor. In regards to support for high school students who plan to enroll in college after high school, school counselors are available to assist families with any questions they may have about the college application process, applying for scholarships, and a student ensuring that your student is prepared to meet their post-secondary goals. School counseling departments organize times for college representatives to come to their high school to speak with students that may be interested in attending that specific college or university. School counseling departments also advertise scholarship opportunities to students and encourage students to utilize websites such as Scholarship Central on BB Schools and Going Mary to search for different scholarship opportunities. Each high school also has an access advisor on site who is able to assist families with completing the free application for federal student aid, assist with the college application process and share scholarship opportunities available. 
parents and guardians are encouraged to be a part of the process with their students. So please do not hesitate to contact your student school counselor or access advisor. They are available to help and want to see your students be successful. Let's move to the questions with our panelists. The questions being asked tonight were submitted by you, the community members. Each question will be directed to a specific college representative and the other representatives are welcome to share their expertise as well. Our first question is going to Ms. Vidalis from George Mason. How, many, how can students use their four years in high school to be best prepared for the college admissions process? I have a couple of different pieces of advice when it comes to using high school as really that preparation time for college admissions. So first and foremost is over the course of your four years in high school, really make sure that you are challenging yourself with the coursework that you are taking. And as you are getting higher up in high school, also take um, sort of progressively more challenging coursework because you really wanna make sure that you are demonstrating to colleges that you are ready for that extra level of rigor that you will find in a college academic environment. So whatever types of sort of advanced coursework that your school has to offer, it's really a good idea to talk with your um, counselor to really make sure that you are taking the classes that are the right fit for you, as well as that are going to help you demonstrate that academic rigor to colleges. Um, next thing I recommend as well, really dovetails well with what you're already doing by being here, attending this panel or watching the recording later on, but really utilize the resources that are at your fingertips through your school, because there are a wealth of information out there to help you through this journey of deciding what colleges you want to apply to, where you want to go, how to be competitive in the admissions process. So don't overlook the value that you have right there in your school when it comes to the opportunities that are available to you. Uh, next thing I recommend is to be involved. And that can be involved with things that are with your school, whether it be a club or an organization, sports, or also being involved outside of school as well. Because that's really your chance to sort of dabble in the different areas that you might be interested in pursuing when you get to college. If you want to go on to medical school, it's probably a good idea to volunteer in a hospital in some capacity. If you are wanting to go on to veterinary school, maybe you want to volunteer in an animal shelter. Do you want to become an educator? Maybe you should be involved with, you know, student teaching in some regard. Those things that give you hands-on experiences that'll help you decide whether or not something might be the right fit for you or not when you're looking at what you want to study in college and what you want to pursue. And then the last thing I recommend to students is make sure that you are exploring all of your options. Um, oftentimes, sometimes students think the default answer is that they have to go immediately to a four-year university, but there are other options that are out there and they are very valid options for students. So, and you want to make sure that if you're choosing that four-year college pathway, that is the right pathway for you. So you're not just doing it because you think that's what you have to do, it's because it is something that you are wanting to pursue. So make sure that you are looking at, you know, if a community college might be a good fit, transferring, maybe you're interested in the trade schools, military, all those other things that are out there, make sure that you're not just going by default to college, make sure it's the right fit for you. Thank you, Ms. Pedalis. Next question is going to Ms. Pinier. How are advanced placement, international baccalaureate, and dual enrollment courses viewed by your school? Great question. Um, probably one of the more common questions we get, you know, I'm not sure, should I take AP over dual enrollment or IB? And honestly, this can vary by institution. So certainly um, research all the institutions that you're interested in. For William and Mary, we view all of them equally as rigorous. Um, as my colleague, Ms. Dallas at uh, George Mason mentioned, we do like to see that you've increased your rigor throughout the year. So maybe and you know, however many opportunities are available at your school, whether that's AP, um, dual enrollment or IB, maybe you started with a few and then you know, the next year you had some more and maybe the year after that even more. Um, the nice thing when you apply, uh, we get something that's called a school profile from your specific high school. You know, we all say holistic, uh, uh, you know, admission, admit, uh, holistic review. And, and that school report is important for us to kind of contextualize exactly what your school offers. Not every school offers 27 APs and we certainly don't expect you to take all 27, that's insanity. Um, but, you know, if IB was offered, 
We do like to see that a student is pursuing the full IB diploma. Um, and again, there's really no preference between like AP or dual enrollment. Um, for the admission process, again, just for William and Mary, it doesn't matter if you've tested and what your scores are with those. Granted, if you're admitted and you want to gain course credit, we do offer credit um, depending on the score for those AP, IB um, exams. And uh, especially for Virginia Beach, if your dual enrollment is with, for example, TCC or any of the Virginia Community Colleges, um, or even some of the four-year colleges, uh, that credit can still transfer over um, when you come over to William and Mary. But Definitely look into those, talk with your counselors if those uh, you know, AP, IB dual enrollment courses are something that's available to you. Absolutely would love to see that on your application so that we know that, um, or on your transcript so that we know you are ready to succeed once you are in college or university. Um, and especially at William & Mary, that's something we're, we're certainly looking out for. Thank you. Next question is going to Ms. Moore at Old Dominion. VBCPS students have the opportunity to attend different academy programs through an application process. Examples of some of these academies are the International Baccalaureate, Math and Science, Global Studies and World Language, and Entrepreneurship and Business Academy. Does graduating from an academy in VBCPS give students an advantage in the admissions process? Thank you, Ms. Chowns, and thank you to everyone that's logged on this evening and those of you that are participating in the various academies. Old Dominion does absolutely recognize those academies. If you are a student at Lanstown or you attend the uh, STEM Academy through Lanstown, we do have a memorandum of understanding that is formal with those engineering design courses. So that could be advantageous to those of you that may be thinking about pursuing engineering at Old Dominion. If you are an Ocean Lake student, we did recently visit with your uh, Math and Science Academy. Uh, just last week, myself and few faculty members did visit the academy and speak specifically to students about opportunities in nuclear medicine, cytotechnology, nursing, dental hygiene, just to name a few. So we recognize those opportunities there. At Bayside Health and Science Academy, I did go out there with a few faculty members just two weeks ago to speak to students that are thinking about going into health sciences. Many of our faculty members do want to help us recruit students. They wanna talk about their programs. They wanna give you that local option where you could certainly be very successful. We understand the credits, we understand the school systems, we understand the students. Many of our faculty are alums of Virginia Beach Public Schools and many of our uh, students that are enrolled in many of our STEM and health science programs come from the various academies. We also work with the arts. I know there's a governor's school of the arts in the area. So I would say it's always great just to get the connections. You know, it's great to have that one-on-one -on -one visit from myself along with faculty. It's great to have a person who understands your program. And definitely if there's a memorandum of understanding, an MOU that's on the books, that's very important. That means that this is something that's state level and it's actually signed by the president and other faculty members. So we certainly look forward to working with all of the academies in Virginia Beach. And you know we wanna know about those things and certainly we'll consider them as we're pursuing those admissions processes. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Next question is going to Mr. Penix at Virginia Tech. How would you describe the social environment at your school? Great question. I would say um, students and families, as you're going out and looking at your schools, you want to kind of um, get a sense as each campus to kind of, um, to know what's going to be comfortable for you. So at Virginia Tech, like I stated earlier, we are a large institution. So you're going to see where the campus environment um, in the fall is definitely very active and engaging. I would say the students is, we say some of the happiest students you're going to find <laughs> at Virginia Tech. And it all happened because the fall and football season is happening at the same time. So it's always something that you can do throughout the fall. But I think as you get away from just going to the athletic mm -hmm. events, you have to find, as I tell both of my sons who are in college, you have to find your people. You have to find a group of people that you're going to love spending the most time with. Mm -hmm. Academics, definitely going to take care of itself. You have to be ready for that challenge that's going to happen. But what are you going to do outside the classroom? Um, at Virginia Tech, we do offer what we call our living and learning communities. There's 15 living and learning communities. 
So when you're choosing your residence hall, you can choose it by your faith. The core cadets is a living learning community. Um, the engineering program has a um, makerspace group of students. So it's each residence hall have an opportunity for close to 100 to 200 students to live in the same environment with the same interests. Um, I like because my son's a freshman there and he lives in the Ujima um, learning, li living learning environment. And that's for students of color who are looking to um, do cultural events, um, identify with people and their um, different race and share that with the campus. So listening to him, he loves that living learning community. Um, and then other students who are doing like outdoor adventures. So if, like I say, hiking, canoeing, all those different things is big in our environment. So we have living learning communities for that as well. Of course, there's going to be Greek life. We have well over 35, I think close to 40 different um, sororities and fraternities on campus. So if that's what you're looking for. Um, you'll be able to join those different um, 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 organizations after your first year. So you have to be there at least one year before you can join any type of um, Greek life in that sense. But the environment is really engaging. I always say it's happy. You always gonna find students who wanna talk about their experience and Hokie Nation is real. I didn't graduate from Virginia Tech, but one thing I can see with my son, um, everyone there just loves the place and they're super engaged with their academics, but really engaged with giving back to the community. Um, community service is big for us. Our um, motto, Uprozen, that I may serve, is really something that students engage into because they go out and do community service projects um, just about every weekend. So. Thank you, Mr. Penix. Next question is going to Ms. Roundtree from Hampton. How many colleges do you recommend students apply to? Yes, uh-oh. Okay. Um, yeah, so as far as how many schools a student should apply to, I don't think that there should necessarily be a specific limitation or a set number on how many schools a student should apply to. I would say, I know that nowadays um, with many students applying through the Common App, what I've noticed in a pattern that uh, my uh, the my other colleagues and myself have noticed is that a lot of students tend to apply through the Common App and they'll just check off all these schools and they don't really have um, they haven't really done their research on this specific institution or university. Um, so I would say if you're applying to a school, make sure that it's a school that you're truly passionate about or a school that you seek interest in or a school that might have uh, the specific major that you're considering and majoring in. Um, that's more so as far as when you're applying to colleges, how um, I think that you should um, I think that's the route that you should take when you're applying to colleges. Um, a lot of patterns that I also notice is that many students say, oh, well, I want to go to Hampton because my mother graduated from Hampton or my grandparents graduated from Hampton or my great grandparents. I think that when it comes to looking for the school of your choice, you have to think and you have to ask yourself, is this school a good fit for me? Can I picture myself attending this school? Does this school have the major I wanna major in? Can I see myself living here, making friends here? What is the environment like? What are the professors like? Um, you know, how far is it away from home? Um, you know, those are questions that I believe that you should really ask yourself. So definitely, um, now I wouldn't limit yourself to just one school. Um, I would at least maybe select at least a good 10, but I don't think that there should be a minimum or maximum requirement. Just make sure that you definitely do your research on the institution and just ask yourself if that school is a good fit for you. Thank you so much. Next question is going back to Ms. Vidalis. What percentage of applicants do you accept? So when it comes to Mason specifically for that question, um, it's gonna vary a little bit every year depending upon the applicant pool. So on average, it's usually within the 80% range. But what I generally recommend to students, um, not only when they're looking at Mason, but looking at a lot of other schools as well, is don't get hung up on the acceptance rate of a school because that doesn't really tell you the whole story. And if you're looking for a metric of if you're in a competitive place or not, maybe look more so at like the average GPA or sort of what the average curriculum looks like for a student who's been admitted. And if instead you're trying to kind of determine if it's a good fit for you, exclusivity isn't going to be a good indicator of if that school is a good fit for you or not. So that tends to be something 
I think a lot of us in admissions are trying to dispel as a bit of myth of admissions is the more selective a school is, the better of a school it is. And that's not really the case because it's about what's going to be the best fit for you. And that's not going to be translated just into an acceptance or a denial rate. So if you want to look at schools using that as one of your metrics, you certainly can. But I think there's a lot more valuable piece that you can use when deciding if a school is going to be a good fit for you or not. Thank you so much. Next question is going to Ms. Pinier. Do either the weighted or unweighted GPA hold greater importance in the admissions process? Yeah, another great question. So I'm gonna say it again. You guys are gonna be tired of me saying holistic, uh, but you know it really just depends. Um, so we don't take a preference one over the other. It's truly just gonna depend on what does your specific high school use? So again, when you're applying, especially through the Common App, that's how the one application we accept at William and Mary, you know, we receive something from your counselor and from your high school that kind of gives us your school profile and how GPAs are um, given at your high school. So sometimes those are reported as a weighted GPA. Um, sometimes they're reported as an unweighted GPA. Um, for us at William Mary, we do not scrub GPAs. We don't make it like fit this 4.0 mold just because we receive GPAs that are kind of all over the board. Um, so it truly is just going to depend on what scale is used at your high school. There is no um, like negative connotation if you know a school is using an, uh, an unweighted um, versus a weighted. It's all the same to us. Um, it just matters on you know kind of where do you fall in that. So you know when we receive your school report or your report from your school counselor, we can kind of see what's the top GPA, whether that's out of a 4.0 or maybe a you know whatever the high is for your weighted GPA, and then kind of where is your um, GPA in that scale. So I hope that wasn't too confusing, but once again, it really is just school specific um, and however it's reported, no preference one or the other. Thanks. Thank you. Next question, Ms. Moore, is there an advantage to applying early, to applying early action or early decision? Thank you, Ms. Chown. So early action and early decision are actually very different. Um, I will go ahead and just preference that, preference that with those, those two distinctions. With early decision, it's actually a binding agreement between you and those specific institutions. So I could say that your advantage there is that you are guaranteed, you know, you're locked in, you're bound to that institution, you are going to attend if they are to offer you admission early, as in early decision. With early action, it is a non-binding agreement. Um, you still have the option to either accept or decline that offer. And that, did, that then leaves you in the driver's seat in terms of where you will ultimately go. I will say advantages to either one, you are hearing back earlier. So if you're a person that wants to go ahead and get that decision in, you know, the Common App opens up in August. So some of these early deadlines may be as early as November. So you could be hearing back, you know, before the holidays or around holiday time. So that gives you the rest of your school year to then plan. You know, if it's an early decision, you know where you're going. If it's early action, that's one less decision you have to worry about. So definitely some advantages there in terms of the timeline. Also, I will state what we do with Old Dominion, we have early action, we're not binding, we don't have early decision. And an advantage to that is that you are, of course, reviewed for merit scholarships early. So if you're a person that wants to go ahead and be reviewed, go ahead and get your decision in, you're often hearing back from us, like I stated earlier, before the holidays. So that's something you can discuss over dinner, you know, over the break, and just have time to visit and just and, and consider that decision as you're getting back your others. So definitely some advantages. I encourage you to look at both, um, see what both schools or both types of decisions are, are out there for both uh, institutions, and then make sure that you're making a wise decision either way. Thank you. Mr. Penix, do you have any tips for writing a unique essay? Are there any topics that students should avoid? Yeah, great question. I would say um, stick to the topic. <laughs> so each school probably is going to have a topic and you want to make sure you stick to the topic and answer the questions. Um, some schools may have a writing um, a number limit for words, um, so you don't want to go over those words. Um, so definitely with the um, common app, 
Um, they have an opportunity for you there and give you a word limit, but, and then have it proofread by probably your counselor at your school or an English teacher. It's really good to um, utilize your resources. It's another great piece of advice, um, no matter if with the essay or if it's just the application. I think what you'll find definitely in your school is you have great resources in your counseling office. So take advantage of that. Um, tell students at all times. We're a little different because we don't do the essays. We do writing prompts. So each one of our four writing prompts at Virginia Tech is 120 words. So in my presentation, I tell students all the time, you can write 150, but it's going to cut off at 120. So whatever's at 120, make sure it's a period. <laughs> so it has to make sense. So you want to make sure you understand what's being asked of you. And within our each of our writing prompts, there's about two or three questions. So if you stick to the questions and stick to the word count and make it your own. Um, one thing, the second part of the question was about what would I avoid? Um, since we've been reading 45,000 applications this year, um, I think we're all talking about, we're hearing about the struggles within the pandemic year. Um, if you're gonna write about those, make it impactful, you know, make it honest. Don't just say, I hate it. Don't keep it simple. Just how did it impact you? And what did you learn from it? How did you grow? So when you're writing about those things, I think what a missions council, what we appreciate is seeing how students grow. We want to learn something more about you within that essay that's going to help us make a better decision. So that would be my advice um, for the students. Thank you so much. Ms. Roundtree, with many colleges moving to test optional, do you recommend submitting an SAT or ACT score? Are there any disadvantages or advantages to submitting a score? And do you recommend one assessment over the over the other? Yeah, so I do want to start off with this. I strongly would encourage all students to at least take the SAT and the ACT, regardless uh, whether the school is a test optional school or not. Um, so I do want to start off with that, at least just take the test. I know that, you know, because of the pandemic, a lot of uh, schools are becoming to be test optional. But if you have the opportunity to take the test, definitely at least take the test. Um, now, in terms of the SAT and the ACT, um, is there a disadvantage submitting the scores? Well, um, if the school is already a test optional school, like our school, um, we've always been, Hampton, we've always been test optional even prior to COVID. Um, if students have a 3.3 GPA or higher, they don't have to submit their test scores. Um, but if you know that you tested low, on the SAT and the ACT. Um, well, I'll start, well, to back up a little bit, I would see what the average is and um, for that, what the average is for that university and what scholarships they offer based off of those SAT and ACT test scores. So, um, cause I know the word low can be relative, right? But um, depending on that school, if you did have, if you did score low on the SAT and the ACT, and it is a test optional school, then I would not recommend submitting the SAT or the ACT test scores. Um, if it's test optional, and if you know that you had a low score. Um, but if you did score pretty average, and it's test optional, go ahead and submit those SAT and ACTs anyway, um, because you never know, you know, you could get additional scholarship money for that. Um, I know specifically at Hampton uh, for our merit-based scholarships for those students who at least have a 3.3 GPA, 1030 on the SAT, 20 on the ACT, they're qualified for the merit-based scholarship. And the higher the score, the more money we give at Hampton. And our scholarship money ranges from $5,000 to $25,000 per year. Whereas if you just had the GPA of a 3.5 or higher, you're just limited and you're capped at that 7,500. So every school is different, but um, if you got a, different, a decent uh, test score, I would definitely submit those scores. Um, now, as far as a preference, whether we prefer, prefer the ACT or the SAT, we definitely do not have a preference. So I suggest to just take both. Um, some students prefer the SAT over the ACT or vice versa. So if you have the opportunity to take both, um, definitely take both of those because you might score differently on each test. Thank you. And, oops, sorry, this one is going to miss more. Uh, can you please explain the admissions process for students who have part committed to participate in NCAA athletics? 
Sure, I can explain a little bit about that. I don't specifically work in athletic admissions, but I do know the basics. Um, at Old Dominion, we're a division one institution. Students have to be registered with the National Clearinghouse and eligible for D1 athletics. So if they're registered and they're eligible and they've been recruited, they typically go directly through their athletic liaisons, whether that's recruitment coordinators, recruitment staff, athletic coaching, athletic coaches. Those coaches will then bring them through the process of NCAA D1 um, eligibility. Once they're committed, of course, they will then be uh, passed to admissions. We have an athletic liaison specifically in admissions that works with our athletics at ODU. So we know what players, what teams, what rosters were able to process that admission. Remember, you do have to meet those eligibility requirements. So whatever the NCAA is requiring to be an athlete in terms of grade point testing, et cetera, you will have to be eligible through that. So you're not coming directly through admissions in general per se, if you're a recruited athlete on the D1 level. And I've been told that you'll definitely want to check with your coaches to make sure that you're eligible through your high schools first and just make sure that you've gone through proper recruitments, you know, speaking with your school counselors or if you have an NCAA liaison in your school counseling office, make sure you've had those conversations even prior to the conversations on our end on the, the college level. But that will be handled directly through your athletic liaisons. Thank you. Ms. Batalis. What is the admissions process for an honors college or program within your school? So when it comes to Mason's Honors College, there is sort of a separate part of the application that you are required to complete. So um, first and foremost, and you'll find this at a lot of schools, is that there's a specific deadline by which you need to apply. And for us at Mason, if you want to be considered for the honors program, you also have to apply as part of early action. So that's that non-binding application type. So if you're submitting an early action application, you'll get asked the question of if you want to apply to Mason's Honors College or not. And then there are um, a series of writing prompts that you select from. And that essay that you write is going to then be reviewed along with all the other materials that you submit with your application. That'll include your um, academic transcript, extracurriculars, letters of recommendation, um, the other essays that you've written, not really SAT or ACT scores, those aren't important to our honors program, um, but uh, all those items that you've also submitted in addition to the honors college essay will be reviewed for the honors program. So I also really recommend that if you're looking at the different honors programs at different universities, make sure that you are checking um, if there's a certain application deadline by which you must apply and submit your application to, because oftentimes there is, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much. Ms. Pinye, how can students best prepare themselves throughout high school to be in a position to be awarded scholarships? Great question, and again, you definitely want to research multiple institutions that you're interested in applying to and seeing what different scholarship options they offer. It really does vary um, institution to institution. Um, for William & Mary, we can consider every student for a merit scholarship. There's no separate application. It's all part of our, built into our admission process. Um, we have a few different merit scholarships. And in general, what we're looking for is a student who has you know, shown some kind of leadership uh, capacity, you know, whether it's in a, you know, extracurricular club or involvement or at their school or in community. Um, we love to see that they've um, possibly participated in some type of, you know, a project like a research project, service project, something that kind of helps like, make them stand out um, in comparison to their peers. We certainly look at um, any complimentary letters of recommendation, um, and certainly academically. Um, we know not every school ranks, um, and, and so it doesn't hurt if your school doesn't rank, but in general, we're looking at students um, who would be um, generally in the top 15% of their class um, for any of our merit scholarships. Um, while it's not an academic scholarship, William & Mary also offers financial scholarships for students who've completed both the FAFSA and the CSS profile. So for all of our Virginia residents, um, if there's any demonstrated need, we do meet up to 100% or the full cost of attendance for 
our students. Um, so I always recommend, you know, when people are, uh, students are inquiring about uh, scholarships that if there's, they think they might qualify for um, any need to certainly complete both of those financial aid applications um, to see if they can be awarded additional aid. But really it's just being your authentic self in your application. We love to see that you've taken advantage of rigorous courses. You've done some things, you know, outside of school for your extracurricular involvement. Um, and those are all things that can help uh, make you stand above the rest to be considered for one of those merit scholarships. And certainly, um, I mean, beyond William and Mary at any institution, there's a nationwide uh, scholarship, you know, search engines and most of these, um, you can apply for scholarships that you can, you know, apply to any school that you end up attending. So definitely do your research and checking those out. And um, I know, I know it's extra work, but uh, if it means taking out less uh, for your higher education, it's, it's definitely and totally worth it. Thank you. Mr. Penix, how do students apply for scholarships and financial aid? Yeah, just piggyback with what um, Monica said. Um, each um, university is gonna have an application for the most part. So make sure you pay attention to each one that you apply to, definitely once you get accepted to, to apply and understand the deadline. For us, like our early action hadn't been released, but the application deadline to apply for financial aid and scholarship was January 22nd. So you had to have that information to get priority review when it comes to scholarships and to financial aid. For us, financial aid, um, it's the FAFSA form, free application form for student aid. So you want to make sure you complete that in a timely fashion. Like I said, Virginia Tech is by January 22nd. Each school will have a different time, um, time limit when they go for priority. Um, knowing that the application opens up on October 1st of each year. So the earlier you fill it out, the best it's going to be for you to obtain different type of financial aid. And the scholarship application for us is a separate general scholarship application, and it's at the same time, January 22nd. So uh, definitely ask those questions when you get to each way institution, because we all are just a little bit different. Thank you. Ms. Roundtree, what types of scholarships are offered by colleges? Yeah, so as my colleagues mentioned earlier, um, you know, we do offer, most schools have merit-based scholarships. Of course, financial aid is available if you fill out that FAFSA packet, um, athletic scholarships. Um, so um, just like Virginia Tech said, uh, you know, you definitely do have to look and research the school because every school is different in terms of what types of scholarships they offer. Um, specifically at Hampton, uh, you know, we do have that merit-based scholarship, like I mentioned earlier, um, that 3.3 GPA, 20 on the ACT, 1030 on the SAT, which ranges from five to $25,000 per year. Um, we also do understand that we're in a pandemic, so all students cannot take the test. Uh, so for those who have a 3.5 GPA or higher, we do award those students 75 500 per year. Um, we did also add on additional scholarships. So we also have our Character Matters Scholarship because Character Matters to us so much at Hampton. For those students who write us an essay that exemplifies good character and then also a letter of recommendation that just knocks it out the park, someone to say something really, really special about them. Then us as counselors, we handpick students that really, really stand out to us. And those students are awarded $10,000 per year. Um, typically at Hampton, in order to maintain your scholarships, you have to keep at least a 3.3 GPA or higher. Well, the Character Matters Scholarship is super easy. Think about the name, Character Matters. So all you have to do is maintain good character, do what you're supposed to do anyway. And as long as you do that, you'll get that $10,000 every single year. So we did add on that. And then also we have our Legacy Scholarship. So for those students who have parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents who graduated from Hampton, those students are awarded $1,000 per year. We do have scholarships outside of the Office of Admission as well. Um, like I said, we are a Division I school. We have athletic scholarships. You heard me uh, mention the band earlier. We do have band scholarships as well. Auxiliary is also included with the band scholarship. So if we have any dancers, any flag girls, color guard, that's also included with the band scholarships. They offer as much as 40,000 per year, which covers full tuition, room and board. Um, and then we also have Navy, Army, 
Army and Marine ROTC scholarships. Um, so that's specifically what we offer at Hampton. I can tell you in the Office of Admission, we gave away, um, well, we granted at least uh, five, mm, $4 million worth of scholarship money last year to uh, students. Um, so you have lots of opportunities. You know, it does depend on what school you're going to. But, you know, I don't want you guys to feel boxed in and think those are the only opportunities you have. You can always apply to outside scholarships as well. Um, so definitely try to apply for as many scholarships as you can and do your research on what those uh, universities and institutions offer. Thank you. Ms. Moore, what search engines do you recommend for scholarships? Yes, thank you, Ms. Chowns. I recommend definitely looking at your major search engines like College Board, that's always a go-to. Um, I also send students to Fast Web to look for other scholarships. If you attend a Virginia Beach City Public School, you have an access advisor in your school. They specialize in financial aid and scholarships, so go see them, they often know Plenty of resources. They may even have some search engines on the accesscollegefoundation.org website. You will also notice that we have a lot of links through our individual colleges. You know, look at the financial aid websites of the different colleges. Look at your programs, as Ms. Roundtree stated, Army and Navy ROTC. You know, look at your STEM programs. Look at community organizations. Look at your public school systems. You know, see what scholarships may be out there for you. If you are participating or thinking about majoring in something specific, maybe look for scholarships surrounding that major. I think there's so many untapped funds that go out, go along out there if people just aren't searching for them or taking the time to apply for them. So definitely just start up a spreadsheet of different websites, you know, start looking through, ask your school counselor. There may even be a scholarship coordinator in your school counseling office. You have an access advisor in your school counseling office. There are people that we work with. So we definitely wanna be on both sides of you on the college side and the K-12 side to help you access those scholarships even before you attend any of our institutions. And if we have anything specifically at ODU, we put everything out there on the financial aid section of our site, You know, types of aid, scholarships. These are the websites you can go to. These are the deadlines. That way you can be aware and be proactive on your end as well. Thank you, Ms. Moore. And yes, each high school does have a scholarship coordinator, but you can ask any school counselor at your high school to help you. And our last question for the evening is going to go to Mr. Penix. Do scholarships have expiration dates? I would say yes and no. No, it's so mainly yes. So it's uh, by, I know both of my sons are at different schools, but they have received scholarships. And a lot of times those are per year and they have to renew those scholarships. And then the ones like uh, Ms. Roundtree is talking about, as long as you maintain your GPA and update those each year, that's what I say it recurs for each year that you're a um, full-time student at that institution. So once again, ask the questions at the school that you're gonna attend, make sure um, you stay on top of deadlines. And I, I would just end just saying, utilize your resources. Um, Virginia Beach has some great resources in the counseling office and people that's gonna be there to help you out. And we partner with the people that you get to see everyday students. So understand that, that um, people on this end of the desk, the colleges, we work with the high school side and we're here to help you, whether it's scholarships or just understand the application process. Thank you. Well Wow, what great information about the college admissions process and how to be best prepared to enroll in college. I was a counselor for 15 years and I think I still learned some stuff tonight. So thank you all for that great information. I would like to thank our facilitator, Annie Chowns and all of the panelists for their time, expertise and thoughtful responses. I would also like to thank the VBCPS community for taking the time to be here with us virtually this evening. As a reminder, these sessions are recorded and will be available on vbschools.com in a few days. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night, everybody.